Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Merci d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. I'm Ted Hewitt, President of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, or SHRC as we call it. I'd like to acknowledge that SHRC's offices are situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. As we're meeting in a virtual environment and from various locations, we also acknowledge from coast to coast to coast, the ancestral and traditional territory of all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples who call this land home. Je suis très heureux d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui au nom du Sérassage pour présenter le quatrième volet de notre série d'entretien public offert en partenariat avec la Conversation Canada. Le CRSH est euh, l'organisme fédéral de financement de la recherche du Canada qui appuie la recherche et la formation en recherche dans le domaine, dans le domaine des sciences humaines. Les chercheurs et les étudiants qui l'appuient euh, permettent de mieux comprendre la condition humaine, la pensée et le comportement humain, les cultures et le fonctionnement de la société. The work of scholars in social sciences and humanities disciplines has never been more vital to respond to society's challenge and seize new opportunities, from post-pandemic recovery to climate change and the environment to indigenous <coughs> reconciliation. We are delighted to partner with The Conversation Canada to bring the perspectives of some of Canada's best and brightest scholars to the public. This series of talks provides a unique forum where we can hear directly from academics who have important views to share that can enrich our understanding of people and world affairs. Aujourd'hui, uh, notre invité spécial est Rachid Sumela. Monsieur Sumela est professeur à l'Institut des Océans et de la Pêche uh, et l'École de politique publique et d'affaires mondiales à l'Université de British Columbia. Ses recherches portent sur les questions d'économie, d'inégalité sociale, d'océanographie et de changement climatique. Guidé par une vision de transmettre un océan sain aux générations futures, il a créé le partenariat Ocean Canada. Cette initiative, financée par le CRSH, regroupe 22 partenaires de recherche officielle, dont les universités canadiennes, les organismes communautaires, des Premières Nations et Pêche et Océan Canada. Les contributions exceptionnelles de cette initiative lui ont rapporté le prix Partenariat 2021 du CRSH. Samela's research con contributions have also earned him a fellowship with the Royal Society of Canada and appointment as the Canada Research Chair in Interdisciplinary Oceans and Fisheries Economics. In 2017, he won the 2017 Volvo Environment Prize, often called the Environmental Nobel Prize, and the Peter Benchley Ocean Award. And in 2021, he was named a University Killam Professor. <laughs> professor Samela is joined today by Hannah Hogue, Deputy Editor of Environment and Energy at Conversation Canada. Anna is an award-winning journalist with over 15 years experience reporting for print, online, and radio news outlets. So thank you again for, to everyone for joining the conversation. Je vous remercie encore une fois d'être des nôtres. And now I'll hand things over to Hannah and Professor Sumela. Thank you so much, Ted, for that introduction and a warm welcome to everybody who's joined us for the event today. I have a few words for our audience before we begin. Uh, both closed captioning and simultaneous interpretation are available for this event. For closed captioning, you can click on the link below the video screen. For simultaneous interpretation, select the globe language icon at the top right of the screen. Today's interview will be followed by a Q&A. You can submit your questions in English or in French using the Q&A function at the top right of the platform. You can ask your questions at any point during the interview and we'll answer them near the end about 30 minutes later. It is really so exciting for us to be here today and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So, uh, Rashid, I've heard you say that the focus of your research falls under economics, social inequity, oceanography and climate change. In your research career, which came first and how did they all eventually fit together? Yeah, and so the way, the way. Uh, by the way, thanks to you, Hannah, and to Ted for, for the introduction, to all of you for making time to come here. 
I know your opportunity cost of your time is very high, right? And you chose to join us, so thank you for that. Yeah, in terms of the way we do our research, I think our, our guiding principle is understanding the deep connection between people and the ocean. So that's a starting point. If you, if you look at what we do when we go to the ocean, essentially we do two things. One, we take the things we need, the things we like, into our economy, into our culture, into the social system, we do what we do with them, and then we produce waste in the process. And this waste goes back to the ocean. So good things come from the ocean, bad things go to the ocean. And for our research group, the key thing is we want to do research that really can help society so that we make sure we don't overtake and we don't overpollute. And clearly, you need all disciplines to be able to do that. No one discipline can do this. You, you need to understand the physics, the biology, the ecology, uh, the chemistry of the ocean. You need to understand people. This is where share comes in, the economies, the culture, the social. And you also need to understand pollution. So that's why we pull in all these disciplines, integrate them with the lens of economics in order to help us manage our ocean sustainably into the future. So we're talking to each other in Toronto and normally you're on the Pacific coast, but here in Toronto, we're about a thousand kilometers from the Atlantic Ocean. And even though Canada is known for these extensive coastlines, the oceans can sometimes seem very far away and we don't necessarily have that day-to-day -day sort of interaction with them. Can you paint a picture for us about the role the ocean plays for our lives here on earth, whether we live near the coast or not? How important is it to us? You know what? Uh, for anyone listening, the ocean is simply too big, too important to ignore, okay? Whether you are in Toronto or in DC by the coast, the ocean does so much for us. For, for example, the ocean produces half of the oxygen on Earth. So that, that made, made me to say, look, the ocean is our life, no matter where you are on Earth, because Without the ocean, half of our oxygen is gone. So imagine that you don't have the half of the oxygen you need. You become half a person. What is half a person? So oxygen alone. And then talk about heat, absorbing, absorbing a huge part of the heat, absorbing carbon. In one example, we looked at uh, how much animals in the high seas, that is, in areas 200 nautical miles into the ocean, which is usually not country waters. Those animals, we compared the economic value of the carbon sequestration they, they give us versus the value of the catch. We take a catch deficiency and it was 10 to one. The carbon value is 10 to one. If we are going to clean up our CO2, the one they do for us. So, so these are just a few examples and I haven't even started talking about the fish. People in Toronto do eat fish. <laughs> Sometimes it's from freshwater systems, but a lot of times it's from the ocean. So you don't have to be by the coast to benefit from the ocean. By the way, the ocean is 70% of the Earth's surface. 99% of the space for living things is the ocean. So it's just too big for us to ignore. We need to protect it. And because it's too big doesn't mean we cannot protect it. We have the brains, we have the empathy, we have the technology. We have the sense to know that without the ocean, we will be the ultimate loser. So, hey, no matter where you are, take care of the ocean because you are actually taking care of yourself. So thinking a bit about protecting the ocean and taking care of the ocean, I mean, that suggests that things are amiss and not as good as they might be. And one of the things that we've seen over the past several decades is that several fisheries have collapsed completely. The one we often hear about is the cod fishery off the coast of Newfoundland, uh, but there's also others like sardines off the coast of California or even the Pacific bluefin tuna fishery. How would you describe the current state of the ocean and fisheries at this point in time? What's the trajectory? Unfortunately, the trajectory is not good. It's not good. And you, you don't need to go far. Just look at the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. Their prediction is that a third of all our commercial fish stock, that is a commercial, those we know about, are in trouble. Yeah, they're either overfished or depleted. That is a third. But that is the FAO. They are usually quite conservative, right? There are scientific estimates 
There is one from Australia where they, they, they estimated half of our fish stocks are in trouble. And like you said in your introduction to this question, it's happening everywhere. In every continent you can find one or more fish stocks that have really collapsed, whether it's Peruvian anchovitas in the 80s, our court stocks here of Newfoundland, Namibians, they used to take, people used to take 2 million tons of Namibian pilchard. Today, they cannot get 20,000. Just think about the scale. So this is a big global issue that we all need to work hard to, to avoid. Are we running out of fish? Oh my gosh. There is one, there's one a study actually that predicted, and this was very controversial, right? They predicted that by 2050, if we don't do anything drastic to protect our ocean and the life in the ocean, we might lose most of our fish, 2050. And this was controversial. Uh, people went after, after the authors, right? Which is okay, fine. But what they did is they look at the trajectory and they said, if you project into the future without a concerted effort, we are going to get there. And, and people didn't think this is sensible to do because we do something. But actually I thought that was a good warning for the world to see what is the potential damage we are, we are causing and we need to do something. And, and I mean, if we lose those fish, what are the consequences? How important are they to our lives, our health, our nutrition, and also livelihoods around the um, world? You see, I'm shaking my head, yeah. You know, the ocean, you know that <clears throat> annually, we take about 100 million tons of fish both legally and illegally, some of them illegally, but that's our estimate. 100 million, our team, uh, see around us at UBC, that's the big job, one of the big jobs we do to estimate this. 100 million tons. If you turn that into the equivalent of mature cows in terms of weight, that is what? At least 100 million mature cows. If you assume one ton, the cow is one ton. So, so this is a lot of biomass. To think about the, the food security, nutritional, the jobs, 260 million people and some income from ocean fisheries alone, right? So that is huge. But that also means we should think about what is happening to the ecosystem. Even the ocean, as large as it is, what system can sustain 100 million tons out each year, right? The 100 million cows, right? This is, this is your stuff. And we are not even using, we are not using sensible gear to fish. You use bottom trawlers and crack up the ecosystem and the habitats. Uh, lots of things need to be done to protect this amazing stuff, yeah. Mm. So when we're talking about fishing, it's not sort of just the simple throwing a net in the sea all the time in terms of, or at least even in terms of stock depletion of fish. What are, what are some of the different um, factors or I guess influences that are, are having a negative effect on the ocean and on fish? You know, one of the way to look at fishing, you can, you can split it in a number of ways. One of them is to say small scale and large industrial scale, right? And the small scale is important because then we are talking about coast, coastal communities, indigenous communities, First Nations people, right? They fish with small boats they, to feed the family, to do local economics, right? You sell some in the local market and so on. Those are the small scale. And then you have the big industrial, big trains that go all over the world. There is one paper that, that calls this kind of fleets is uh, from the University of Winnipeg. Uh, Fickers did a paper, they published in science. The title is The Roving Bandits. So you have big boats that just go around. They take the thing for profit fast, move to the next one. And fire, you can track the decline of uh, sardine and pilcher stocks around the world by this phenomenon. California went down. Then you go to Peru, take it down. Then you are in Namibia, right? And the issue is, I think as a society, we have to decide what do we want our fish of wild fish to do? Is it to fish and nourish people, to support our culture, social systems, or to make big bucks, right? And so that is what you see here. And one thing, our policies are also not helping. Uh, subsidies, uh, mm -hmm. you, my audience would know that I talk a lot about fishery subsidies. One of the results our group found was that most of our $35 billion of subsidies goes actually, 80% of that, goes to large industrial fishing base. 
And this just blows me away because number one, that is taking down the fish stocks, the habitats, but that's not the only thing. That means you are also disadvantaging small scale fishers, community fishers, indigenous fishers. You are disadvantaging women fishers, right? Gender problems, because most women fish with small scale, not like. So this is so crazy what we are doing. One time I was actually playing with an idea. If I could get the fish to talk, I would say, Dear fish, tell me, what do you think about we human beings? What do we do to you? Our governments give us subsidies to come and just catch the juveniles and everything. So what do you think? And I think the fish will simply say, you guys, you're just crazy. I mean, how could you do this? We are here, we feed you, we support you, and you use your taxpayer money to kind of take us down? How, how crazy can you be? Yeah, this is me whispering to the fish, you know. The, the the World Trade Organization has had a, re, a long running negotiation to try and put an end to these harmful fishing subsidies. Um, and it's felt a couple of times I'd say in the last year or so that it's getting close, but we're yeah. not there yet. Can you briefly sort of explain what's going on and why, why we're at a, I guess at a sticking point of ending these fishing subsidies, the harmful ones for big fishing fleets in particular? Exactly, so here we are. In 2001, the world gave the WTO the political mandate to actually help us rein in, rein in on these harmful subsidies. And harmful subsidies are those that lead to overcapacity and overfishing. They encourage overfishing, like fuel. If somebody is paying part of your fuel bill, you are going to fish more than the market will support. And already it's tough to manage these resources because they are common property, they are open assets, they don't respect borders, they go where they go. And then you add to this, the, 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 the free government money, so that takes it down. So the WTO got the money, why? Because this is a global problem, right? The ocean knows no boundaries. I just said, fish don't need visa to move around, right? So we need a global solution. And the WTO is good at handling subsidies for trade reasons. So they got this money. And that is over 20 years now, and they haven't been able to get an agreement. And, and most of the scientists, economists, were not saying take the money out of the community, keep the money there, but let it work for nature and people, rather than take nature down, and therefore the fishing communities, right? We all remember the Northern Cod when it collapsed. How many, how many Canadians suddenly got into trouble financially, right? So that's what we're talking about. And it has been difficult mainly because of all the politics, all the all the all the lobbying and the power play, right? You know, so that is part of it. So we need pressure from scientists, from community members. And so in, in October, they were going to meet in November, and Omicron led to a postponement. I and my team at UBC, we led a group of nearly 300 scientists to write a letter which was published in science two WTO members to urge them to do something. So that's the kind of pressure. And the DG, the latest one, the first woman, by the way, to be Director General, she's leading the charge. She actually did a, a handover ceremony where we hand off the letter to her. And so there's a lot of uh, movement. We're hoping they're meeting in June. So all of you can just fingers crossed and put pressure where you can for our politicians to do the right thing for fish and the fishers and the community and for all of us because now we're talking about infinity fish right how to keep our fish going through time and uh please help us get an agreement i think they are close from all i hear we just need to push them over the finish line i, I want to touch on something you just said which is this idea of infinity fish and it's sort of a vision or a dream that you have can you explain it a bit and, and tell us a little bit about where you came up with this idea yeah, Infinity Fish is a concept that came out. Uh, I was invited to give a talk in Namibia uh, years ago, and I go up there. And one of the things I told them, knowing Namibia, if you know Namibia, there are two things that are two resources that are very hot. The one is fish, the other is diamond. And, and the diamond is done offshore, part of it. So there's always conflict between the fishery sector and the diamond sector. So I land there and I go to give this talk, the room full, and they were mining the diamond people there and ministers from not only Namibia, but the continent. And I told them one of my messages to them is that 
fish is actually more valuable than diamond. And how did I explain that? Fish is renewable, right? So you can continue to go back and take some fish, feed your family, sell it or to send your kid to school if you're a coastal com community member forever, right? If we do it wisely. So, and mathematically, anything that gives you benefit, if it, if it, if it, if it is small, if you sum it to infinity, the benefit is infinity. Therefore, fish is infinity fish. So that is where that came. On the other hand, diamond is not forever. You dig a ton of diamond today, it's gone forever. Forget about what they tell you, the marketeers. Diamond is not forever. You can't go on to dig it the same ton again and again. Only fish and other renewable resources. So that the idea, as I formulated it, is we, the current generation, it is almost an obligation, as I see it, to ensure that we pass on a healthy ocean, teeming with life, to our children and grandchildren. So they too can have the option to do the same for those who come after them. So that's the idea. And in this way, we'll keep infinity fish alive. The idea of, of summing small amounts is taking me back to my grade 12 math class, but um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great concept. But one of the things you mentioned there is this idea of regeneration. And so in order to continue having those smaller, perhaps even larger additions to keep the sum moving towards infinity, um, you have to have sort of a, a nursery or a place where these fish can replicate and grow until they're also a reproductive age. Um, yeah. You're among some of those that have called on governments around the world to close the high seas to fishing. And those are the areas that are beyond national jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, how like, how can these, but could closing those areas actually contribute to growing fish stocks? And what sort of progress have we seen on that to date? Yeah, closing the high seas to fishing or what we also said is turning it into a fish bank for the world. Right. A fish bank where once the fish get in there, they are protected from all our big boats. They get the piece, they are living things. Remember, fish are like people in many instances. So they go there, they get the piece, they, they grow, they can regenerate, they lay eggs, eggs can move in and out, juveniles can move in and out, adults too, when it's too dense, they move. And then we can catch them cheaply, pumping less carbon, and what is, so it's good for the economics, it's good for the biodiversity, obviously, and also good for equity. Because at the moment, only about six, eight countries take more than 80% of the, of the fish values in the high seas, which is supposed to be owned by all citizens of the world, right? Because it's outside country waters. So you improve biodiversity, you improve the economics, you help with carbon emission, and, and, Small countries in, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, in, in Africa can also catch the fish when they come. Remember, most of the fish they catch actually go in and out, right? We have a few species that live all their life in the high seas. We call them orphans of the ocean because they are not owned by any country. So they are really vulnerable. And, and because the high seas is, is deep and there's little uh, light, it's a very, they're very conservative species. They grow slowly. They live very long, more than a hundred years, some of them. So there's a colleague in Oregon. She says that anything that can live longer than your grandpa and your grandma, please leave them alone. So that is almost what you need to do. It's like mining them. They become like that when you just fish them out. So they, and it's only 1% or less of the total global catch. We don't lose much. We get a lot. And so this is the idea. And the first time I started talking about this, many people thought I was even crazy to think about it. But actually it's becoming more and more, we've got our first high seas protected area. The Ross Seas, the countries actually ended up agreeing. So it's protected. When I said this, there was a, a Russian diplomat. He didn't like the idea at all. And then, but the next time we met, he said, maybe we should close the high seas where, where there's no management at all. So. I'm seeing movement, a bit of interest, who knows? This is the beauty of science. You see an idea, you just throw it out and you never know where it goes, right? So hopefully we'll be able to close a good chunk of the high seas in order to create more benefits and support infinity fish. Yeah.
What I'm, a lot of the focus of your research is on the economics, and you've brought it up a couple of times already. And I guess now that we sort of are getting a better understanding of the state of the oceans and fishing, um, what are some of the other things that we as a society that continue to do that fuels overfishing from the economic perspective in particular? What are the yeah. things we're doing wrong? Like, what, where are we missing the point, I guess? Yeah. Uh, one, we talked about that already, subsidies, right? You use government taxpayer money to fuel overfishing and, and also sabotage the sustainable development goals of the UN, poverty reduction, hunger, and all that. So, so that is one thing we do. The other thing we do is actually the way we value, the way we value the ocean, nature in general. It's very narrow valuation. It's mostly about what we can catch and sell. But economics is not about all of that. We talk about non-market values. So we need to apply economics more comprehensively. Anything that human beings, we the people care about, should be taken into account. If some of us feel that we have to conserve the fish for the fish sake, that should be part of the calculation, right? And so we are not, we are doing truncated valuation. And that then means that we are missing out for example, this, the carbon value, the sequestration value, we are doing a number of papers now to appear in front of me and colleagues, about 10 to 12 papers, where we are looking at the, at the carbon value of, if we don't overfish, what do we get through carbon sequestration? And it's looking like it's a lot, actually. So we need to be comprehensive in our valuation. That can then guide all that we do. And so ho hopefully that can lead us to better management, and again, to infinity ocean and infinity fish. So it's really it's really sort of looking beyond just the, the cost of the fish in the market and how much the, the fishers are taking home and looking at all the other integrated components uh, of the ocean, the things that are sort of networked in with this fish and what that greater value is, whether you live on you know, one a Pacific coast and you have a cultural association with the fish or whether it has a greater carbon sequestration value for uh, another region, it's all that mixed together. Yeah, yeah, you are right. And actually I have an example in, in my book, which is the title, Infinity Fish is the title of my book, which was published in October last year, right? And, and in there, in chapter 17, yeah, in chapter 17, I have an example where my, my, my group, we work very closely with the First Nations uh, Fisheries Council of British Columbia. Uh, and the, the whole, our goal was how do we capture uh, the values that First Nations put on soccer salmon, for example. It's not just about catching it and selling it. It's about port life. It's about the culture. It's about the future generation, about the health. So we, we develop together this simple valuation methodology where we say, okay, we went into the community actually and this service and got data as a pilot and, and calculated all the things the community cared about with their soccer and, and turned that into economic value. And, and what we found is that the market value, the total value is 9.5 times mm -hmm. the market value. So that's the kind of thing we are talking about here. The valuation approach has to be comprehensive. We are missing out a lot. And that is leading to all the overfishing and all the pollution, the plastic in the ocean. And that will be a good starting point. Uh, economists, my, some of my fellow economists say, get the price right. I actually say, get the values of valuation right. And we will get on a good path towards uh, infinity fish. It's, it's interesting because the ideas you're talking about, I mean, we're specifically talking about fish and oceans, but obviously they could apply, be applied to any sort of uh, resource or relationship we have with nature and, uh, and the things we depend on. And as you say, the waste we dispose into it as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, in um, fact, well, let me quickly, I, I gave a talk at the UN uh, years ago and about discounting, because that's what we are talking about, right? Also the valuation, how we discount the current and the future, right? And, and I finished the talk and somebody came and told me, you know what, why you're talking is not just about fish. We are discounting our own lives away. So, so it's about nature, it's about our life too, because everything goes back to nature actually. 
So. I was I was actually hoping you could elaborate on that idea of discounting a little bit because that sort of seems to be the one of the sources of the why we're in the situation we are now why we're in this problem is that you know sort of something that we might otherwise leave for tomorrow to do something else is captured today for our own immediate sort of benefit and satisfaction. Um, yeah. What what does that mean in the context of fish stock stocks and as you say biodiversity or nature more generally? Thank you. I mean. This counting is a very central economic uh, approach to valuation. You know, essentially, if you're talking fish, we are not just talking about today. It's a, it's a renewable resource. It can go on forever, depending on what we do with it and to its environment now, right? Now, if you look at the benefits you get from fish from now into the future, each year you get some benefit. You turn it into dollars. What the economists will do is we discount the future benefits into the present value. So we talk about net present value. So if your discount rate is high, it means you don't give much weight to the future. You keep all the way to, to now. And that is our general tendency as people. We like to front load our benefit and back load our cost. So our discount rates are high for nature. And so we take nature down. So this is really the, the idea of this continent. I think it's fundamental if we are going to deal with our environmental problems, right? It's about how you balance this thing. So, so we launched, my group, we launched something called intergenerational discount mm -hmm. because we found out that the main reason we do this is we value the future generation's fish as if it is our own. We, everything is referenced to now, to us. So we line them up to infinity. But, but in 50 years, I wouldn't be here, but who will be here? The fish will be valuable to her. And so you have to change. So we, uh, we introduced something called the discounting clock of generations. So each generation have their own discounting clock and we use it to develop a new formula for discounting that will take care of the interests of future generations also in the fish. Really exciting piece of work and in my view. So how do we as society or how do governments individually lower that discount rate? How do they sort of push it down in the immediate future and spread it out further? This is, this is uh, there are approaches being developed by economists around. Uh, there is something called hyperbolic discounting. So they don't keep a constant discount rate and they did experiments to find out this. For example, if they ask you, Anna, that are, you are going to get two payments, one year five, one year six, the same amount, how much will you discount the year 16 versus the year five? You give a, a discount rate. Then they say, okay, you get the same amount in year 25 and 26. How do you discount? What they found is that you discount those close to you now heavier than those coming in the future. So they use it to develop hyperbolic discounting. We use the discounting clock, me and my, my group, and we said our problem is that we reference everything to the current generation. So you introduce a discounting clock for each generation and use it to modify the discount rate. So there are a number of these. What we need to do is to get our governments to apply this rather than the conventional one, <laughs> which actually discount our, our future away very badly. So that is, uh, that is uh, there are new approaches being developed. Hopefully, one of them will catch fire in a positive way, not 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 burn the, the wildfire, but but really become closer to the convention, and then we'll start getting policies that will help us achieve sustainability. Um, obviously, in terms of the the sort of threats that we pose to the ocean and to fish, whether that's through pollution, through climate change, through overfishing or fishing in the high seas, these are things that have sort of become entrenched in some ways in the way that we do things. And if we pull them back, um, there you've mentioned there are a lot of people who are sort of fighting to keep things the way they are. And we often talk in sort of environmental issues about winners and losers. And so who... Who are the potential losers in this equation and how do you convince them um, to back policies that will limit overfishing and contribute to rebuilding fish stocks? Are there, you, you mentioned sort of not necessarily taking all the money out of fishing, but to redistribute it in different ways. Are there ways to sort of, um, I guess, incentivize or convince people to, to get behind this? 
Wonderful. Great question. Yeah. So let me use the high seas as an example, right? Just to concretize this. I just told you that about six to eight countries actually take most of the benefit. So this is already a uh, strong blah. By the way, Canada is not one of them, not the US either. There are a number of big countries that are not part of this. We are talking about China, Taiwan, Spain, you know, the big fishing nations in, in that sense. So eight of them take, so there will be a block that will not like this because we are we are going to lose if we close the high seas. And then the question is, what do the rest of the world do, right? And there are various mechanisms. We can talk nicely to them and say, look here, what you're doing is harming the environment and all of us, so let's come up with a new equation. We could even compensate them if they want to do that. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, actually, you guys, you've been messing up the system for years. You pay for the management of the closed area, right? Because they, they benefited from a from a common common people, common property. So, so there are all sorts of ways you can, and we can put pressure. We can put pressure. When I when we published this report, I got invited to the United Nations by three different blocks of countries who really love this. The small island development states, they love this. Uh, you have the African countries. And actually we even have a, a member of parliament, a Canadian one who is really looking at this and thinking this is a sensible thing to do, closing the highs. So, so there's things happening and hopefully uh, we'll be able to push and make sure that the global benefit it takes over rather than this small group ripping up and, and actually messing up things for us. So we're getting to close to the Q&A portion of the interview. So I'm going to remind the audience that they should submit their questions in English or French. Uh, you can use the Q&A function at the top right of the platform. Um, but uh, Rashid, you know, we're here today because you received the partnership award from Shirk. And um, I'm interested in hearing more about what sort of partnerships you establish and why you think they're so important to being able to do your research. Wonderful. Yeah, so this is, um, um, this is really great. I mean, uh, I kind of wasn't, wasn't really expecting this question, so, but I think it's good you did it because, yeah, we have to acknowledge this is, uh, Sheik has got this partnership grants and they are probably, I, I think they are the, 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 the highest funded ones that I know about. And we are specifically encouraged to develop partnerships to look at big issues. So our group, we decided to look at the ocean, which is a big issue, right? And like I said in the beginning, we do take things, we do put things back in there. We take things to meet our needs and our desires. We need to do that well. We need social science. So you need all this range of knowledge. We need lawyers, we had lawyers. We had a philosopher on our team, right? On the Can Ocean Canada Partnership. We have not only academics, non-academics. We have the Vancouver Post Authority. We have First Nations, we have NGOs. You know, we have the DFO, the Department of Fisheries and Ocean. They actually supported our, our pro proposal saying that because we are in the university, we are able to do things they couldn't do, which is fair, right? There is division of labor. There. So we build up this at the top of us where we had about 100 people. And a big component of that is the training of highly qualified personnel, graduate students, undergraduates, postdocs, early career scholars. So this is really the whole team taken together. And, and so that is what Sheikh has awarded us for, for, for bringing all this together and, and actually publishing massive amount of publications. It's unbelievable. One of the innovation we created was to develop a project CV. So I'm saying this for my audience. Please, when you have a project, start right from day one and have a project CV where you document all that you have done, all the various things. You'll be shocked at the end of the day what you actually have, have done. So we had that. And I think it's part of the reason we, our documentation was solid. The work was good. We had a movie making professor on our team who documented not only our outcomes, but the process of the research. So there, there was so much innovation. Look, we had evenings with Vancouver people. We, we and the Vancouver Aquarium, we collaborated. They are our partners, right? They are non-academic partners. So in the evening, every quarter, we did a panel 
with our team members and with community members to discuss ocean issues. This was one of the best things we did, actually. So that's the kind of thing you need, partnership, co-creation, interdisciplinarity. And we had them all. And I'm very grateful to Sheik, really, for making this possible, because there you go. Yeah. Thank it's, you. It seems like it's such a complex problem. You really do need that input from, from all sorts of different types of people in different communities who have all sorts of different experience to really try and uh, solve it overall. Um, so I'm going to go to a question from the audience um, and I'm just going to read it here. Uh, do you think that the w at the WTO, the minister should distinguish more clearly between industrial and artisanal fisheries and emphasize the need to phase out the harmful subsidies for the industri industrial distance fisheries. Um, and there's a second part to the question. It says, China as the country with the largest fishing fleet in the world seems to want to maintain fuel subsidies for its long distance fleet, but do more to restore the fish in its own water by dropping fuel subsidies for the coastal fisheries. Could that mm -hmm. become a stumbling stone for concluding a deal at the WTO? Let me know if you want me to repeat any of those, any part of that. Yeah. So, so the first one is the small scale, life scale question. Yeah. Right? Should the ministers do, do more to distinguish between those? Yeah. You know, the, the WTO mandate actually has something for small developing countries. Uh, they, they, they have a special term for them, giving them uh, some leeway. And in the draft that is being discussed now, there are things like giving less developed countries about two years or five years to catch up, to improve the science, and before they, they follow the regime that is accepted. There is also provision that says, if your total subsidy is less than 0.7% of the global subsidy, then you can be given a grace period. So there are things that are built in. And I think just for the adjustment, that is a good thing. But if you are a small country, if I was leading a small country, I would be the first to take away the, the, the harmful subsidies. I will keep the money in the community, support people, whether it's education, whether it's all the other great stuff that you can do to improve the fishing community. Do that with our taxpayer money, but don't, don't destroy, don't destroy the fish base. For example, you can pay people to go and clean up the ocean, marine debris, plastic rather than catch fish which is already depleted. So keep the money there, let it do good work rather than destroy the fish. So, so that is being, is part of the negotiation, all right? Yeah. Now, your second question is? The second part of the question was focused on China. And oh, yes. um, the person asked, China as the country the largest fishing fleet in the world seems to want to maintain their fuel subsidies, but try and do a little bit more to restore the fish in its own water by dropping the fuel subsidies there in the coastal fisheries. So having that division in fuel subsidies for long distance fisheries versus coastal fisheries. And they're wondering whether or not that might end up being a stumbling stone for concluding a deal at the WTO in June. Yeah, the thing is, I, I, I really don't know how it's going to pan out, but what they announced essentially was, okay, we're going to turn our harmful uh, fuel subsidies and, and make them use the money for restoration purposes, restoration or, or, or making the thing sustainable. If they did that, then they will see some positive benefit in Chinese waters. But as the question and the person who has a question said, China is the largest fishing nation in the world. It is also the largest giver of subsidies the harmful subsidies to their fleet. And China is a big distant water fishing nation. So if they just do this domestically, I think the problem is still there because that means that distant water will get the subsidies to go to West Africa, uh, go to the island states, go to Latin America and scoop up the fish, right? Both legally and illegally. And that is going to still be a problem. That is probably what, what the, the, the person was alluding to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question here. Uh, the, the, the person thanks you for a very interesting talk. Um, and then they ask, what's your conclusion about aquaculture concentrated in coastal areas? Are you for it or against it? Yeah, aquaculture is controversial, right? So I'll tell you what I think about agriculture because I've been thinking a lot about it. And I started 
thinking about agriculture one there was i gave it i gave a talk i don't know where i did this now you know but and when i finished the talk it was about how to sustain our ocean somebody just came to me after my talk the usual thing when you finish people come to ask questions or comment and he said why are you worried about wild fish i said why not sustainability of wild fish said, why not and he said you know what we can farm all the fish we need in one high-rise building in Hola, he told me. Man, you can imagine how shocked I was that somebody can actually think this is possible. So then my immediate reaction is, oh my God, that high-rise building has to be really high, okay? And will that building give you all the inputs you need? The food, the water, the fish meal and oil and everything. And will the high-rise building just swallow up all the waste you create? You know, so that made me to start thinking, look, we have a problem here. And so I think many of us are over optimistic about the contribution of agriculture. And we have to tamper down that over optimism. I, I believe there's a role for sensible agriculture, sustainable agriculture to contribute. Like agriculture that is vegetarian. Now they don't need fish meal or oil. You don't need to crush three, three kilograms or tons of fish to get one ton of salmon or two or 10 tons, right? That just doesn't add to our food security. But if you are doing things like tilapia and carbs, the things that they don't care, they just eat anything, right? Vegetarian, then you can add value. So as everything, we need to do this wisely. Otherwise, it can come back and bite us, right? Mm -hmm. And the other day I was on the panel and they asked me, and they asked us on the panel, why in BC so many people are skeptical about agriculture, fish farming, and when, when the person was trying to say when the damages are not that clear. And I said, look here, even if I assume that the damages are not that clear, the thing is there's no trust. The people don't trust. The people, they've been told many things about the environment and it turned out it's not true. And so even if you have an airtight agriculture system, the people, so you got to work on the trust first. And, and trust, you don't get it from nowhere. You have to work at it. You have to consistently tell people what you mean. So, so there is all these things coming to, to play. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting point in that um, we can be, as a society, be brilliant and come up with all these innovative new technologies that seem to cause a problem or solve a problem, but they might cause more problems. And then there's also the trust aspect involved. Um, I have another question here that asks, uh, can you discuss uh, the waste in the ocean and consequences on fishery growth? And I think they're speaking very broadly about many different types of waste that uh, yeah. have all sorts of different impacts. Yeah. You know, one, one thing about, about waste, it's almost, it's almost like catching too much fish. If you put too much, the system is going to not be able to process it, right? And that's what we're doing. A lot of marine debris, you, you've seen pictures, right? If I just talk about plastic alone, from what we have learned over the last few years, it's unbelievable. There's one estimate that says if we don't take care by 2050, there may be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Oh my God, think about that, right? So this is huge stuff. And it surely affects the health of the ocean and the health of life in the ocean. These things break plastic into small microplastic. The fish see, they think it's algae, it's food they eat, it pollutes them, and it can actually pollute people when we eat. There are people looking at the health consequences of this, so we're going to know more, right? So putting waste into the ocean is it's not a good thing at all, really, because we, we're killing the system that we depend so much on. Mm -hmm. So as much as possible, and the way to do it, I was part of a, part of a national sciences, uh, mathematics and medicine committee that looked at the US contribution, contribution, uh, not in, in a good way, to plastic pollution in the world. And, and, and when we did that, we got the chance to speak to different groups. One of the uh, group we talked to was the White House, science and technology unit in the White House. They read our report and had questions. One question was, what kind of research can you actually recommend for, 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 for the US to do? This is the White House science group there. 
you know, I said, you know, two things are the problem with plastic, and I think they can relate to other uh, waste pollutants in the ocean. One is that plastic lives almost forever. Mm-hmm. And also it breaks into those uh, micro tools. So I say, imagine that we can create a chip that will let your PPE, PPE, right? You know, with COVID, there was a lot of use of that. After they, they've done their job, that chip just it disintegrates them, right? And to buy the grade of us, that's the kind of thing we need to be able to, to, to save our ocean. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess beyond plastics, we've even got fertilizers creating dead zones in coastal areas, and then even the waste heat, you might argue, and the way that that is sort of shifting fisheries and fish stocks moving around the world into new places as well. Climate change, climate change, ocean acidification, deoxygenation, all stemming from climate change, but also nutrient runoff, like you said, from agriculture, going to make create deserts in the ocean. And actually, the North Pacific is one of the hotspots for deoxygenation. We have a project looking at that. Then the Arctic is a hotspot for acidification. And the tropics are, the fish are moving to the Arctic and the poles. So it's almost like they are moving from hot water into acidic water. My mm-hmm. people just think about that. Yeah. Um, another question here asks about uh, when it comes to restructuring the way we value nature and renewable resources, where should we start? What is the source of this high discount rate for nature? Where is it perpetuated? Yeah, I think it, it, it stems a lot from our economic system and our economic models, right? Think about it. Every quarter, companies have to report their profit, right? So it's a quarterly thing. And when you get a high profit this quarter, next quarter you have to beat it. Yeah. So, so this is really a lot about now. If you miss your, your target, profit target, your stock goes down. So I think it's the structure of the economy which mostly values market benefits and, and doesn't value the non-market side uh, enough, or if at all, right? In the book, in my Infinity Facebook, when we, when, when we look at papers, economic papers that looked at market and market value, we found only 1% of economic papers in environmental economic journals actually talked about anything other than market value. So that is where, where, where this comes from. I mean, there's just pressure to grab things now and maybe invest them where you, you, you take the public to make it private and then you. You know, protect your financials and leave the cost for other people. So it's really about bringing those non-market values to the discussion and integrating them into those discussions. And into policy, and yeah. into policy. And, and there are policy instruments uh, our societies can use, right? To, to incentivize, incentivize people, make people internalize the consequences of our various actions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question here about domestic fisheries management policy. So the question is, with respect to domestic fisheries management policy, harvest controls and reduction seem to have been the focus of the regulators rather than enhancement or habitat remediation. At some point, harvest controls render the fishery unviable and the capacity, including the infrastructure, is lost. Is this approach to fisheries management short-sighted? Yes, it is. It's it's short-sighted and it is not comprehensive. You know, the thing I tell them, number one, without the fish, there will be no fisheries, right? And without the habitat, without the home of the fish, there will be no fish. So this thing is not, we're not not even doing it for the sake of the fish. Without the fish, nothing is there. There will be no fishes, no fish dollars, no fish, no seafood. So if we are really putting our mind in the right place, we have to be comprehensive in looking at the whole ocean system, right? And, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so motivated looking at the ocean. So many things are interconnected, right? Our, our world is like that. Think about COVID. When COVID hit, the tendency is to protect our countries, but you can protect Canada as much as you want. One flight can just change everything. So you better think about protecting the whole world from these viruses, right? So you have to think of protecting the whole ocean if you are going to guarantee your fish. Otherwise, it's going to go pop one day and, and that's it. And maybe they will tell you, who cares, Rashid? Some people have told me, 
Uh, I don't care about tomorrow. Then there's a real problem, right? <laughs> but normally you should care about tomorrow. Come on. Anyway. Yep. I have a short question for our last question, but uh, yeah. maybe a difficult one. Yeah. How, how can we as individuals help? Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a good question because uh, in our systems, a lot happens at the individual level, right? I mean, the most primary one is voting, right? You have to vote. I mean, Canada has lesser problem with people voting. I think the percentage is, is high relative to other developed countries, right? So you got to vote. And I think when you vote, you got to be comprehensive. If you care about the ocean and the environment, that has to be factored in. You can't tell me that you care about the environment when you vote for people who whose aim is to wreck the environment, right? So, so voting is important. And our individual decisions are also important in addition to voting. What you eat, where it comes from, whether you, 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 you use uh, single-use plastic or not, all those things add up. But the voting part, I put a lot of interest because we need comprehensive policy to guide individual action. So there's connection to the whole also, yeah. Yeah, we need the policy in place in order to have the larger impact. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, there's no framing, right? And then what that what that does is it leave the, the taking care of all these important things to only those among us who care, right? So you think about it. So okay, I care. So I'm going to try to make sure I don't eat fish from depleted sources. But if the rest of the population doesn't, my effort is zero. So we can leave this to only those who care. That's why policy is important. Otherwise, you won't get to where we want to get to. So uh, thank you, everyone who joined us today so much for your thoughtful questions. And of course, thanks again to Rashid for the great interview. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And this is the fourth one of the In Conversation series. Mm -hmm. The last talk is scheduled for June 14th with Professor Carol Levesque and whose ideas, um, whose areas, sorry, of expertise include indigenous peoples and indigenous knowledge, community integration and sustainable development. And we really hope you join us for that as well. Thanks again and have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Anna.